Hi, everybody, and welcome again to the Risk Matrix videocast podcast with James Junkin and myself, Dr. Martin. And we're going to talk to you again about some uh, things that are, are up in the news lately. Um, but first, hello, James. We're back in the Matrix, baby, and football season's back. Roll Tide. But first, Dr. Martin. Are you aware that Veriforce has an epic opportunity coming up in op- in October? I, I do, but I don't think our listeners do. I want you to I want you to tell them about it if you well, would. Well, Veriforce has teamed up with the National Association of Safety Professionals to offer their certified safety manager course, the CSM course, in Houston, Texas, at the Veriforce headquarters, beginning on October sixteenth. And this course isn't just about you know lectures and slides. It's hands on. It's interactive. And it's tailored to meet the needs of all participants, from those just starting their careers all the way up to seasoned veterans. This this course ensures that you get the knowledge that you need to excel in managing a safety program and and in all sorts of safety management roles. So registration is happening now, and the class is filling up fast. So visit nafweb.com forward slash classroom that's naspweb.com forward slash classroom and look for the october 16th csm the woodlands course Veriforce clients registering receive up to a 300 dollar discount at registration so i hope if you have opportunity to take advantage of this outstanding uh offering from Veriforce and nasp Yep. Great courses there from NASP. I'm glad that Veriforce is, has, uh, in their wisdom, teamed up with NASP to, to give this valuable course. Um, I know there's some great instructors on that, and um, you can't help but learn some really great things uh, going into your career. So check it out. Um, so James, today I'm going to talk about something timely, or I'm going to bring up something timely, and I'm going to put you on the spot if that's okay. 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 Um, you see what's going on in the world with some of this uh, climate change, uh, warming, uh, hot weather. Um, we're not going to get into the heat stress just this time. But what I really want to talk about is is about a year ago, uh, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, you wrote a um, an article and you posted it on LinkedIn. And it was about um, hurricanes um, from your perspective, because you live in hurricane uh, area of the U.S., Unfortunately, Indeed. you've had your home damage destroyed and, and have now just rebuilt it. Um, but, you know, I want to talk about preparedness and then I want to talk about how to react when you have to react. Um, and what what are the what are the tools of this? Because, uh, you know, just just to mention one, I mean, we've got this this hurricane that's hitting the West Coast hardly ever happens. Um, seeing some of the pictures that come out of there and um, they are devastating. Um you know, from every perspective, um, but certainly for people that don't see this kind of stuff all the time. So yeah, take us a little bit about, uh, tell us a little bit about your article that you wrote, read, uh, you wrote last year, and then maybe kind of morph it, if you would, into some specifics for people who are going through um, unexpected weather events because of the way the world is kind of changing. Unexpected weather events are now to be expected. And in this article I wrote for Bear Force, I focused on hurricanes because that's, I live in the target zone and it was like in the eye of the hurricane. And I've experienced everything from Hurricane Katrina to Hurricane Gustav to Hurricane Isaac to Hurricane Harvey to a couple of years ago, Hurricane Ida living in the Gulf Coast. If you live in the Gulf Coast, you're going to experience hurricanes. But the point of the article was, You know, when I was a child, these were once in a lifetime events. Everybody talked about Hurricane Betsy in 1965 or or Camille that came along or Hurricane Frederick in 79. Now, every two or three years, uh, we're having these type of massive category four, category five hurricane events. But beyond just the hurricanes. It's, it's earthquakes, it's fires, it's, you know, now we've had a tropical storm that by the time this broadcast, uh, hopefully will be uh, over and out of California, but the first time in 85, 88 years, they've been hit with tropical tropical weather. Now by Gulf Coast standards, a tropical storm is, is baby, you know, 
We're, we're, yep. we're having to deal with these category 550 mile an hour wind monsters. But when you consider the topography in California and the rain and all the wildfires they've had and the burns that they have, you know, you can- Hawaii. Hawaii, for example. You Maui. can certainly get yourself into a, a very dangerous situation um, to live through and very difficult to recover from. So as safety professionals, no matter, you know, uh, we've talked this before, I don't do politics, but everybody, whatever you attribute the climate change to, the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's causing it? I am not a meteorologist, nor am I a climatologist. I'm just a safety <laughs> professional. Okay. But I can tell you, it is hot down here. We have experienced day after day after day of 100 degree weather. Has it happened before? Yeah, it's happened before, right? But in the here and now, that creates situations where you can have out of control wildfires, right? Yep. And, and uh, you know, we're seeing this all over. You know, uh, yesterday I was watching the news and in California, they're getting hit by a tropical storm and they have an earthquake. I'm like, man, somebody doesn't like. I mean, I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing at it. I'm laughing just just because um, every time I open the news, there, there's something right. And I'm I'm with you. The wildfires, uh, the hurricanes, uh, mudslides. This is one other, one other thing you mentioned. Um, you know, and it seems like they're hitting with more frequency. Um, FEMA, you know. They do have, um, I don't want to say used to have, but they may have to update that, but they do have a, you know, hundred year this and 500 wow. year that and, and 50 year that and, and things are changing. And, um, you know, I'll bring it up here to the Northeast, right? Things are changing up here back, back in the seventies, we used to have snowstorms, right. That are also emergency situations yeah. that, you know, we'd get six feet of snow, right. And now we hardly get a thing. And so, again, what, no matter what your politics are, things are changing um, and the the hazards are changing. The types of things that you have to deal with are changing. So, I mean, what what are some easy steps for, and, and I'm going to say safety professionals, but even for uh, personal people in, in personal situations, what should they be doing or we be doing in order to prepare, ride it out, and recover? Well, the first thing, like any other hazard, is you've got to determine what the hazard is. If I'm in Wyoming, I don't really need to worry about a hurricane preparedness plan, right? So mm -hmm. what's the hazards? The hazards in Wyoming are not the same hazards that are in the Gulf Coast or not the same hazards that you have on the West Coast, right? So you got to determine what your hazards are. If you're talking about for a, a organization that is very broad geographically throughout the United States, you really need to start thinking about, hey, our response plan cannot be cutter because the needs of people along the Gulf Coast in Texas and chemical plants are not the same as the needs in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And working that in, mm -hmm. so a good hazard assessment. The other thing you mentioned uh, related to that hazard assessment is this historical tracking by FEMA of 50 year storms, 100 year storms, 500 year storm, et cetera. Well, understand what happened during that time frame, and people now live and work in areas that they did not used to 100 years ago. The mm -hmm. topography's changed. Uh, we, we've changed the topography, right? I mean, we have. you know, when, when Hurricane Katrina came and it, and it wiped out the levees and it did all this damage, um, we have to recognize that that in in order for progress, we're filling in places that weren't ever meant to be filled in, right? right. And made them land, right? Right. Um, we are deforesting places that that weren't deforested before. We are um, building to meet demand in places that have a little bit more risk, right? Absolutely. And let me give you an example of of, of having a good threat assessment. So um, I, I don't recall right offhand the company it was involved, but it was during Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey hit uh, Texas, the Houston area, Galveston, uh, the western part of Louisiana, and it dumped a tremendous amount of rain, a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of rain. 
And that created a great flooding potential just from the rainstorm. Now, when, normally when we think about flooding, when we're dealing with hurricanes, we're thinking about storm surge. Well, this right. created this created flooding inland from the rain. Okay, so there's a chemical processing plant on the outskirts of uh, uh, Beaumont, Texas, sort of around Orange, Texas, in, in that area, just to the east of Houston. And it became isolated with the floodwaters. Mm -hmm. Well, the particular chemical they had on site had to be maintained at a certain temperature. Though the temperature control was run by backup generators when it lost public service power. The floodwaters flooded the generators fried them out, and now they had no power to the chill units. And then the chemical went critical. There was an uh, explosion, a chemical release. And now at the time when we we never want it to happen, but you certainly don't want to happen it when you got roadways completely flooded, you got first responders trying to get in, you got evacuees trying to get out. And really, what, where should we have thought about that during the hazard assessment? So it's not about and, placing blame, right? But right. You got to learn from other people's mistakes. Yep. And you have to place those hazards on a risk register. Whether you think that they're likely or highly unlikely, they still need to go on the risk register. So I'll give you an example of, of uh, you know, some of the sites that I worked on when I was doing um, safety uh, for a hazardous waste remediation company. Um, we did some work on in San Francisco at some decommissioned Navy facilities. And we had tsunamis on the risk register. Were they li likely, unlikely? I would say unlikely, but guess what? Guess what? It was on the risk register and we had a tsunami warning and it rose two feet and we had flooding. So, so even if those things are unlikely, they need to get on the risk register and they need to be reviewed every so often, at least yearly, I would say, to make sure that we are tracking that information that can inform good decisions. So I think once you identify and you have a risk register, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised, uh, Dr. Martin, how many people don't understand what a risk register is. Uh, but if you'd like to kind of go into that just for a moment, because some people may not be familiar with the risk register. So, I mean, there are a lot of different theories on how to how to put a risk register together. But to me, to me as a practitioner, um, everything that's that's a hazard or a risk, right, that we can identify as a collective group goes on that register. And they are ranked according to whatever risk policy you use to to calculate your risk based on what your acceptable risk is for your company, right? We're not talking acceptable risk general. We're talking acceptable right. risk for your for your company. And a lot of people, I think, see, well, we're going to put these hazards on there, and it's just a reminder for us to, to mitigate the hazards that are on there. And it's, it's not just that. Right. It is to put those, those hazards on there and mitigate them, but it's also to monitor, monitor risks that, Maybe unlikely, but we can foresee that they may become a problem at some time in the future, right? So tsunamis, wildfires, uh, 50, 100 year floods, um, you know, loss of power, <laughs> loss of power to the generators probably never happened um, in that chemical facility ever before, right? And nobody ever thought to put those generators on higher ground or build them on the roof or, you know, wherever they should have been. So, you uh, know, it wasn't near uh, a river. It certainly wasn't near the coast. It was well inland. But here's the thing. Never Did they risk state. register the the, the floodwater uh, capacity of the public sewer system, right? That's what we're seeing now in California. Some of the pictures I see coming out of there, um, yes, they're on the coast, right? But many times the flooding happens because the the public utilities are overwhelmed. And this wow. happened in Houston too, right? A lot of happened areas flooded Katrina. in Houston and during Katrina because- that outflow could not be accommodated. Not only could it not be accommodated, it was underwater where it discharged. Okay. So, so who was, who, whose risk register had that? Maybe very, a few, very few companies, but that should have been on there. Right. Um, what do we do? Do we have pumps? Do we build things up higher? Do we put 
critical equipment up higher. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but to me, a risk register has not every conceivable thing that you can think right. about, but pretty much, right? And you don't throw anything off. It's okay to have stuff at the bottom of the risk register that you only revisit once a year, okay? But they should be there because what you don't know can always bite you. It can always bite you. If anything with my experience, dealing with hurricanes, tornadoes, extreme flooding events, living on the Gulf Coast, if anything this has taught me, it's one thing, and it sort of goes along with what you're saying. Preparation is the key. Preparation is the key. If you go into the Weather Channel, you listen to your local government officials and all that stuff we're going to talk about, they all tell you to get a plan and work your plan. But for businesses, preparation is more complex than it is for 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 persons, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for you, know, you got to think about what's my risk? Do I have the right amount of insurance coverage? Number one. Number two, knowing when to leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that may seem like an easy decision, but it can be more complex. You may have a company that has critical operations and some people have to stay and some people have to leave. And then some people that are staying, there comes a point when they have to leave. So those decision-making uh, processes need to be done way before these events occur. So if you get your risk register, you put the risk on there, and then what do we got to do to do to, to mitigate it? You know, or prepare for it, right? Or prepare which for is a business, it, right? which is a business continuity plan in essence, right? You're you're putting together what, what your business looks like in a crisis. Now I want to I just want to add one thing before I let you continue down that vein because I think this is a really good conversation. Um don't rely when you put things on the risk register and you say it's a low risk because X, Y, Z will respond. Do not rely on public services unless you are certain that you are going to be covered when you need them. OK, we, we go over this all the time when we talk about confined space. Right. And we talk about right. rescue teams and confined space. And, and I'm using this as an example because this is a perfect example of relying on something and using anecdotal evidence or just this is what they do so they're going to respond you can't respond you can't rely upon a local fire department to be your rescue team in a confined space for many reasons sometimes it's it's distance many times it's training a lot of times it's they have other calls and you're not the first person on their list um when they're inundated you 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 can pretty much guess you're not going to be able to rely on those services and if you are relying on those services and you want to rely on those services, how have they prepared? Right. How have they prepared? So if I'm in a critical plant function and I am in an area prone to earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfire events, I need to already be working with my first responders so they know what the threats are to the greater community. Mm -hmm. You know, Inside our fence line, we can sort of deal with it. But a lot of times in these major natural disaster events, the situation goes beyond the fence line and spills over into the community. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> During Hurricane Katrina, uh, Murphy Oil Refinery in Chalmette, Louisiana, uh, as the storm approached, uh, made a critical decision. Ended up costing the community. They had a million gallon storage tank full of crude oil. So you either fill that tank all the way up to reduce buoyancy or you pump it all the way down. Well, it was about half full. I think it was a two million gallon tank. And anyway, mm -hmm. what happened with the rising floodwaters, the tank rose, broke off its mooring, crashed into the floodwaters and on top of 20 feet, 16 to 20 feet of water that was inundating the community, we got a million gallons of crude oil on top of it. Mm-hmm. So, and that goes a long way. Any type of oil, gas, anything goes a long way oh, once it's, it's just, released. Just disgusting. And then on top of that, you've got sewage and all the things you talked about spilling over into the community. So that's part of that. No when to leave. Mm -hmm. You can survive the storm, but it's not going to be very comfortable yeah. for you or, or your employees. And what's it worth? What's it worth? Right. I mean, on a personal level, 
Um, you know, you hear about people all the time, especially like in Maui now with the wildfires, they, they're losing everything, right? But you didn't lose your life, right? So that life is most important in all of these situations. Um, and then you think about what, what the business functions are and how you deal with that, right? Because you never want to put your employees in a situation where they are performing their job at great risk to their personal safety. So most of the time I see this would fall under emergency action plans. It's kind of a blend between emergency action plans and business continuity plans. Um, so you get your risk register, you understand what the threats are, and then how are we going to respond? And a lot of times emergency action plans I see are basically limited to fire. Mm -hmm. Fire. Evacuation. Release, evacuation. Their evacuation, how to get out of the facility type of thing. So if you have a specific weather threat, and most places in the United States have some type of specific weather threat, you know, whether it's wildfires, intense weather storm, uh, winter storms with ice and snow and wind and all this other stuff, earthquakes, mudslides, flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, name the season. There's probably a community inside the United States that is going to experience or be under that type of threat. Even such yep. things as severe thunderstorms. Some of these severe thunderstorms come through with 70, 80 mile an hour straight wind winds. And next thing you know, your business is sitting across the street. So mm -hmm. determine what the threat is. Build a plan of action for what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and who the key decision makers are. So where and how you you're going to do it and with what. Okay. Because supplies matter supplies do matter we're going to come to that in just a second the first thing i would say is get your information from reputable sources i'm not going to name the the television channel okay but we got this kind of a joke down here on the gulf coast because you'll see them the hurricane's approaching the weather's deteriorating it's going to be awful. And somebody's walking a dog behind him. It's not even raining, right? No, the wind's yeah. not even blowing. Yeah, and there's no wind. Yeah, and There's no wind. So understand that that's about selling fear and, and ratings, right? That's a different mm -hmm. conversation. Get your information from somebody reputable. Heed warnings from your government officials. And have somebody within your company that's willing to make decisions, that gathers this, that, that sort of an emergency response coordinator, that, that activates your virtual response plan and how you're going about before the event happens, okay? Now, yep. if we're operating a facility and we're going to need people to stay behind, we have to have a plan for that too. Who are those people? And look, you're responsible for your employees, but let me tell you something that's business on. Uh, if you've never rolled out a category four or five hurricane. If you don't believe in God, you might afterward. I'm just telling you, it gets, it gets pretty gnarly, right? Yeah. So if you're going to ask people to stay in that, have a plan for their families. Have a, have a plan for what's going to happen while they're staying, right? You know, Do they have food? Do they have shelter? Is there a place for that. them to go? That's taking care of them. But I'm going to tell you, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, I want to know my family's okay. Then I can do my job. I can't do my job if I'm worried about my family, right? Mm -hmm. So make yep. sure there are plans to take care of these folks' families. That requires proper planning and good communications that go back and forth and let everybody that knows okay. Now we have the event coming. And this is assuming we can plan for this event like a hurricane or a tropical storm, right? We don't. We get a lot of advance warning for that. Tornado shows up, it just drops out of the sky, comes through, wipes you out, and three minutes later, it's gone. There's not a lot of mm -hmm. advance planning for that. But in events we can advance plan for, snowstorms, things of that nature. I, I think plan. you can plan for tornadoes, right? You can't plan for when it's going to happen, but you can plan for if, if, and oh, if it happens, if it happens, and what are you going to do? Right. You live in the you live in that that belt of the Midwest where tornadoes touch down all the time. You have tornado warnings 
you know, um, it, what is enough? Where are your supplies? How are you going to shelter people? Where are they going to go? And, and please don't ever think that all your government agencies are working on this on your behalf all the time, because a lot of these small towns, municipalities, even, even larger cities, they are, they are overworked. <laughs> They're probably underpaid. And, and this is not on their radar. They're, they're, they're probably thinking, well, we'll deal with it when we deal with it. Um, but that's not as a business owner or as a safety professional or as somebody who cares about other people you, you can afford to do. Sometimes, depending on where you're located, the first responders become victims. Mm -hmm. That was the lesson from Hurricane Katrina. Too many of the responders were in the bowl that is the city of New Orleans, the National Guard, the police, the fire department, uh, they, they were all in the in, inside the city of New Orleans. When the levees failed, they were trapped. They couldn't get out. Couldn't get to them. So it was really a perfect strike. So uh, moving sort of beyond that, where do I go for resources to, to help make a plan? Let, let, let me tell you where, where one of the best resources, I think. Ready.gov. Mm -hmm. Ready.gov is a good place for not only business owners, safety professionals, operations professionals, but also as a human being on a personal level. I need a, pro a mm -hmm. plan for the house. I mean, if somebody told you, you've got about an hour to get out of your house and get away from wildfire, flood, whatever, natural disaster that's coming your way, what would you take? Mm -hmm. What would you take? Because and is it packed? Target. Is it is it is it grab worthy? Can you grab everything you need? need and grab get out? worthy stuff. Same thing in the business with the business continuity plan. As an individual, you need a family continuity plan, insurance documents, credit cards, bank stuff, birth certificates. You know, those type things. Critical medications. If you get if you've yep. got cash, I always like to have a little cash on hand. During hurricane season, because if you got to go, look, you may have money in the bank, but if the power's out, nobody's taking your debit card. Yeah. Cash is king. Cash. cash is king. Most everybody will take cash, right? So yep. those are just some of the tips um, to get through and start formulating a plan. Now, let's talk about post event. This can be some of the most frustrating part of of a business owner safety professionals risk managers life is trying to recover and get back up and back to to operations number one mm -hmm. you need to gap your insurance right now and see if you have coverage because you're going to be surprised a lot of homeowners are also surprised that what they thought they had coverage for either they don't they do not. or the amount that of that coverage is so minuscule, we might as well not even have it. Right. 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 So we have to have a plan before the event, a plan during the event and a plan post event. Mm -hmm. And and, and I'm just going to, I'm going to take what you said there about getting back to operations. You need to get back to operations, but you need to get back to operations at a, at a better level. Right. Because even the most robust business continuity plans, uh, emergency contingency plans, emergency response actions, there are always gaps that you can improve upon, right? And so one of one of the things that you need to do once you kind of get everything back in order is to really like look at the incident, the incident itself, but other incidents that are not on your risk register that now should be because you have knowledge that something can hit you like this. Exactly. I mean, how many companies, this is hypothetical. I don't like dealing. I like coach saving. I don't like dealing with hypotheticals, but how many companies in California had an active tropical storm plan? They haven't been hit in 85 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So now they got to experience that. So it's not really the wind it's the results of the rain and all the other things, mudslides and stuff that, that come with that tropical event. Now, one gap that I find most companies have is a technology plan. If all of your technology is housed in servers that are there on your site, 
you're in trouble. Okay. You're in trouble if you have a fire, earthquake, hurricane, whatever. So I like to back stuff up in the cloud. If not, somebody's got to go down there and jerk up your server and run with it. Yeah. And to be honest with you, back in the day, before the cloud, mm -hmm. one of James's roles was to grab the server for our company, give it to my wife, and say, head north. Yeah. Right? Head north. Get out of here. Head north and avoid, avoid the water. Avoid the water. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's really, it's just like any other hazard. But have a recovery plan. Who's going to do what? Who's going to be the coordinator? Who's going to reach out to the file the insurance claims? Who's going to make sure that we've got uh, housing for critical staff if we try to get this thing back up? And here's the other thing I'd like to, to share from a personal note. I have lived through disaster. When I say disaster, I mean not a home standing People worried about where they're going to get food, mm -hmm. medical care. They're all of their lives destroyed. Now, usually what happens is businesses get back to operations way before folks get their home situation straight. So you need to understand that as a business owner, that these folks got things to worry about more than just what happens at work. You're worried about your business. I understand that as a business owner, I worry about my business. You know, I've spent many years building this organization and, and so I want it to get back to work, but also there's a human side too. those mm -hmm. folks may not have a place to live. They may be struggling with food insecurity. Uh, they may have insurance issues. Uh, you know, you're fixing to find out in California. They're fixing to find out. Mm -hmm. Your homeowner's insurance may not cover that tsunami of water that came down the hill and flooded your house. Yep. And you may not be in a floodplain, and now you're fighting between did the water come mm -hmm. from the tropical storm, which could be covered under your general homeowner's insurance policy, or does it come from the flood which needs to be covered under your flood insurance policy. If you don't have a flood insurance policy, you're in trouble. And the lesson from Hurricane Katrina was the individual was caught in the middle. Homeowner yep. said it was the flooding. Uh, flooding said it was the hurricane and the homeowner didn't get paid. And by right. the time you litigate this stuff two or three or four years later, you're sitting there with, with a house that's destroyed. So yep. business owners need to understand that. That is a very difficult time for everyone. So yep. be patient. Have some plan to address some of the psychosocial hazards that, that workers may be experiencing during that time. Displacement. Help when you can. Know what your resources are. For example, post-event, file a FEMA claim whether or not you feel like you'll qualify. File a FEMA claim. Get on record. Understand that a lot of nonprofit organizations uh, will come to help. You know, people love to talk about, Dr. Martin, what divides America on the left and the right and all this stuff. Let me tell you something. I see what's the best of America when we have natural disasters. Mm -hmm. I won't get choked up about Any it. disaster. A any disaster, right? We see what's best about America. Everybody everybody gets together. Um when, when we Before I forget, when we couldn't help ourselves, you yep. know, I've always been one that wants to go help other people, and it was hard to take help. It really was. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna get choked up about this uh, if I ain't careful. Yep. People came from all over the country. They left their homes, loaded up supplies, and headed down and to helped. Help complete strength. Yeah. You saw that, that in, you saw that in Harvey in Houston. I mean that that was there, there were a lot of stories about that. Um, before I forget, I, I want to circle back to to resources. Right, you said ready.gov. Totally agree with you. Um, if you're that person that's coordinating the risk of of certain things or risk of of tasks when there might be foul weather or or these types of things, uh, the NOAA website for for weather weather.com. Um, 
Again, be contacting your local. Center. Yeah, National Hurricane Center. Be contacting your your local government, the FEMA, whoever you expect or we all expect to come in when some of some of these things happen. Find out what their resources are. Okay, I'm. I hate to bring up a sore spot, but like, look at COVID, right? We didn't plan for a pandemic. We had a flu pandemic back in the early 1900s, right? And uh, so, and they wore masks, right? But it was been a hundred years or so. And when this I'll happened, nobody, nobody had, nobody had um, stockpiled masks, right? I'm gonna tell you right now, there's probably stockpiled masks everywhere. Okay, so that that's some of the things that we learn, but we need to keep learning. OK, the other thing is you have this coordinator that's looking at the risk register and helping you improve after an event. They can't just do it once. OK, it has to be an ongoing process, whether or not you have another storm for another 20, 30 years. You still need to be looking every year. Are we re are we prepared? Are we is it on the risk register? Have we? Yes, I know it's low, but, you know, it wouldn't be bad to have this X, Y, Z. Right. And it's low cost to the company to have it on hand. These are the things that you can do to, to you know, to improve after something happens because nobody's ever going to get it perfectly right. And if you do, good for you. I heard a emergency manager being interviewed um, last week and in, in about the response out in Maui to the uh, horrible wildfires that, that was tremendous loss of life. He said, we learn in emergency management from our scars. We learn from our scars. So that's an opportunity for, for us to look at incidents like this and see what went wrong and what we can do to make sure things go right in the future. Now, to bring it back to where Veriforce can help potentially with hiring clients, et cetera, is determining where the risk is in your critical supply chain and making mm -hmm. certain that the business continuity plan that companies have makes sense to you and you're working together as a team, hiring client and contractor working together as a team to help mitigate risk, understand what the risks are. What are we going to do? I like to say this, I use it in football. When I used to coach football and I use it all the time because y'all know I'm from the country. I just come up with all kind of crazy stuff to say. It's too late to start drawing it up in the dirt when the wildfire is a mile down the road. Yep. Okay. Yep. When the hurricane is about to come ashore. When the tornado sirens go off, it's too late to be thinking about, well, what are we going to do if our building gets hit by a tornado and we lose, you know, not forget the potential loss of life. For example, yep. let's set that aside. What if we lose all the records we have in here? What if we lose all the all the stuff that we've built on this construction site or this refinery that we've been working on, right? right? And and boy, you make a really good point, right? This is not just about you. If you have subcontractors and you have a deep supply chain, it affects everybody, right? Everybody. One little one little poke in the supply chain can really gum up the business. You know, exa example given, it's, it's not hurricane related or anything, but the chip shortage um, for right. cars, right? And, and that made cars go up. And I know that's that's kind of a, a benign type thing, you know, can't get a car, we can get cars. But but one little piece in the supply chain, one little chip has bound up everything. And so, you know, are you using a subcontractor that's in the Philippines or in, in a monsoon area or, or a place where there's tsunamis? Or, you know, are you looking at your supply chain as well? And are you demanding of your subcontractors to come into compliance with what your risk tolerance is for your business? Absolutely. So, because, look, things can happen. Now, fortunately, this tropical storm wasn't any worse than it already is. It's causing enough havoc right now being a tropical storm. What if that had been a Cat 3 hurricane or a Cat 5 hurricane that smacks the port of Los Angeles right in the mouth? Mm -hmm. Okay. And now our entire transportation distribution network for things that are coming through the Pacific Ocean is shut down shut down and we need those things to operate we need those things to operate so really it's just about planning it's thinking about it it's drawing on your resources 
plan for preparation of what we're going to do to get ready for this event, what we're going to do during the event, and then what we're going to do in recovery operations. And be very real with your risk register and don't say it can't happen here because it certainly yeah. can. Who would it can. Thought? Who would have thought, Dr. Mark? Who would have thought? Okay. During an 85, 88 year occurrence of a tropical storm hitting California, we're also going to have uh, an earthquake. Right. So, so here we are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this kind of to a close, right? Um, you heard us talk about a lot: um, business continuity, emer emergency action plans, um, what to do, what not to do, um, how to continuously approve. Um, Let's just draw it back to that plan, do, check, act, right? We're, we're, right? We are always in the cycle, always in the cycle. You're not going to do plan, do, check, act, and then stop. You're going to do it again and do it again and do it again. And if you if you don't have that mentality, that's when you learn that you have gaps and the risk overwhelms you. So that's really all I have to say, James. Um, I, I think this was a great conversation. This is one of our better conversations that we've had. We have great conversations all the time, but this was a really good one. Um, and I hope everybody loved listening to it. Um, if you like listening to us um, or you have questions or comments or criticism or whatever, make sure that you follow our page here on YouTube, uh, follow our, our Risk Matrix podcast. Um, put the questions in the chat. We'll certainly respond to you. And we love that you join us here uh, every Thank week. Thank you all for participating, for following us. I see a lot of you, some friends and colleagues out there that, that watch us routinely every Tuesday or somewhere around noon. This program will be posted on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit subscribe. We love comments. We like a debate. Uh, please we love a debate. Join in and tell us, tell me, I'd love somebody to tell me, you're crazy. You don't need to plan for a natural disaster, man. Just fake it till you make it. That seems to work for, for me. Hey, I'd love to have that discussion with you. I'd also like to Let's hear go. Your tips on your experiences and what you've done to help prepare for natural disasters and help mitigate risk. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to get workers home safe from high hazard jobs. Beautiful. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you bring us out with Roll Tide, baby. Go Navy. Football's back. There you go. Um, thanks again for listening to The Risk Matrix, and we'll see you next time.